Hi everybody, welcome to video number four in our first week of the course, Theology, Re Fundamental Theology, Revelation and Faith. And what we're going to talk about now, we're still talking about Revelation and the nature of Revelation. Now we're going to talk about the purpose of Revelation and the manner, okay, the purpose and manner of Revelation. First of all, what's the purpose of Revelation? Why does God bother to reveal himself to us? It's not just to convey nifty information, things that we need to know. It's really to convey salvation, transforming union with God. By the way, in Hebrew, the word knowledge, da'ath Elohim, means a personal acquaintance. In some languages, like French, Italian, Spanish, there's a difference between knowing facts, in Spanish that would be saber, and knowing a person, being acquainted with a person, that would be conocer. In English, we don't have that kind of distinction. So, when you say knowledge, usually uh, it, it means head knowledge, or informational knowledge, kind of saber. And that's the point we want to make here. What God does not want to do is just convey head knowledge to us. He wants to bring us to salvation. So he conveys knowledge that's a personal knowledge, an acquaintance with the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Okay, so listen to what Dave Verbum says, number two. The purpose of Revelation is that man, humanity, should have access to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. See how personal that is? It's salvific to have access and relationship to the three divine persons. Okay, so that's the purpose of Revelation. What's the manner of Revelation? How does it happen? And this is another thing that's really important for us to, to understand what the Council Fathers are teaching. And I'm going to preface all this by saying the word. Revelation is the word of God. Okay, But when we say word in English, and this kind of goes all the way back to Greek and Latin, which is our heritage, we say word, we usually think of verbal utterance. Okay, So verbal communication. Verbal communication is obviously important. But that's not what Dabar Elohim, the word of God, meant in Hebrew. In Semitic culture, word means communication, and they have it all integrated. Verbal and nonverbal communication. You know, words and body language. All that is conveyed in one word, Dabar Elohim, the word of God. Okay, so we're recovering now kind of a Semitic understanding of this idea of word of God. And, and this is what the, the fathers of the council want to teach us about revelation. Day Verbum 2 is the main place we're working with right now. It's reflected in Catechism, paragraph number 53. The way revelation comes to us is through words and deeds, words and actions, words and gestures, words and signs. So verbal words and nonverbal words. Okay, so revelation comes through both ways, and we have to just look at, they're bound up with each other. You can't separate them. Look at Moses, his experience in Exodus 3, on top of the mountain where he notices a burning bush. So the burning bush is a word of God. It conveys who God is. Energy, fire, unconsumed. This bush is unconsumed, though it's on fire. And so it's there that God reveals his name. I am who I am. And then take a look at the Exodus. God tells Pharaoh, you know, people had this idea that gods were local. You know, the gods of the Egyptians had power in Egypt. The gods of the mountains might have power some, you know, in the mountains, but not in Egypt. So, you know, God made very clear that he's more than just some local petty divinity. You know, he had power and he, he tells Pharaoh to let his people go, but he shows his power through the terrible signs or the plagues. Then he shows his power through to Israel, his comfort, his presence. He says, I'm with you. Actually, what Exodus 3.14 means is, I am with you. As who I am, am I with you? That is 
in a good uh, explanation of I am who am and what it really means. But anyway, he shows he's with the people by dealing with their enemies, opening up a path through the Red Sea, leading them by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. You know, Jesus says, he talks about love, he talks about, you know, the greatest love is this, that, this, that a man lays down his life for his friends, but then he does it on the cross. So the cross itself, that symbol, that reality, that is a word, okay? That's a manner of revelation. So through words and deeds from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, that's the way revelation happens, all right? So one of the things I'll just point out in terms of a deed, God created this world. That's a revelation. That's an initial revelation. And you see that reflected uh, in a number of different places um, in Paul. Paul recognizes that in Romans, okay? Uh, the fathers of the church celebrate this. The Psalms celebrate this. <clears throat> Psalm 19, the heavens proclaim the glory of God and the firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day takes up the message, night unto night. So anyway, if you read that Psalm, and I'm sure many of you read it regularly <clears throat> as part of the Liturgy of the Hours, you can see that creation is a revelation of God. The human soul is a revelation of God. In creating human beings as they are, God, we see something about who God is because we're made in his image and likeness. We already saw this in apologetics, the fact that people are not satisfied with the things of this world. They yearn for eternity. They yearn for something more as a sign that we're made for something more. Someone who is mystery, who is eternal, who is not finite like the things of this world. All right. Now, but here's the funny thing. You ever notice how most people walk around and they don't see God in nature? They don't see God in human beings? Why is that? Well, there needs to be a third revelation, and that's the revelation of salvation history expressed in Scripture. That revelation in Scripture, if we allow it to, will open our eyes up to see the revelation in creation, the revelation in the human soul. And this is a beautiful little tradition among the fathers of the church where they mention over and over again there are three books in which we read the truth about God, the revelation, the Word of God. One is in nature, one is in the human heart, the human soul, and the other is the most important because it opens up our eyes, and that is Scripture. It contains the revelation of salvation history, it opens up our eyes to God's presence everywhere. So anyway, this is a beautiful little thing that um, we find in the patristic tradition. Let's go on to another very important patristic principle, and that is condescension. Sin katabasis is the Greek word for it. We find it in John Chrysostom and in other authors, but it means accommodation. It means that God realizes that we are made sensory beings, we, we're, we live in a particular culture, we're historical beings, we're limited, so he adapts his communication to us so that we can understand him. Pretty simple, you know? If you want to be understood when you go to France, you, you try to learn French so you can speak in a language that they understand. I mean, imagine if Jesus preached on the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount in Latin. No one would have understood it. He had Palestinian people there who spoke, everyone spoke Aramaic, they spoke a little bit of, of Greek. Um, but from the very beginning, God accommodates himself. He meets people where they're at and speaks in their language according to their culture. So he lowers himself. Psalm 113 says, Who is like the Lord our God, who has risen on high to his throne, yet stoops from the heights to look down, to look down upon heaven and earth? So that gives us the idea of God's lowliness, where he comes down and accommodates himself to us, first in the prophets and patriarchs, by revealing himself words and deeds appropriate to their culture and all the way through to the incarnation where he, the, the word of God with a capital W comes as a Palestinian peasant. Jesus comes as a workman, as a carpenter, speaking their language, looking like them. Uh, this is God's divine condescension. So really the incarnation is just the culmination of the way God starts the whole process at the beginning. This principle can be seen all throughout, that God accommodates himself to us. So that means something very, very important, and that is that all revelation is historically conditioned. And what does that mean? 
It doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to it. It doesn't mean it, it, that, it, it, that it has no eternal value. What it means is that every moment in Revelation, God is accommodating himself to the original hearers. So it's time and place. And we need to understand the time and place to understand what he's saying to them and then to us. Okay, so that's what it means to say all revelation is historically conditioned. Later, we're going to see every document of the magisterium is also historically conditioned. Every document comes to us from the tradition is historically conditioned. All that means is we got to take the time and trouble to understand that particular, whatever particular scripture or traditional document, magisterial document we're trying to read, we've got to look at the historical context, not read it in our context, as if it was written to us at this moment in our language today. It's just a very simple idea. Now, I just want to point out that there's a real problem with the historicism, and we can't confuse historicism with what I just said, historical conditionness. Historicism is something that arose in the 19th century when historians basically took relativism and applied it to history. Relativism means there's no stable truth. My truth is different from your truth. There's no stable moral values. My morality, your morality, you pick yours, I'll pick mine. Um, that's not what historically conditioned means. These, these historicists said the past is fascinating. We really want to study the past, but it has no bearing on what we're supposed to do today. Things are different today. Um, the past is interesting. It's not normative. It can't make truth claims on us on what we're supposed to believe now and what we're supposed to do now. There's no stable content from the past. It's just interesting. Um, so that is to be sh shunned. You need to have a nose for that historicism. A lot of liberal exegetes from the Bible are infected with that, uh, especially 19th century, early 20th century. So we're not going to buy into that. All right. So, but on the other hand, you don't reject the idea that scripture is historically conditioned because you want to avoid historicism. That would be a big mistake. All right. Now here's something else that's very important to understand about the manner of revelation. The, the way revelation happens is through symbols. There's a symbolic structure of revelation, okay? Let's talk a little bit about what sign and symbol are all about. It's really important to get this down. It'll open up so much for us in understanding human life and also understanding God's revelation and the sacraments. First of all, we all use signs, all right? Uh, I'll give the example of over the door in most buildings, there is a sign that says exit, or at least over the, the door to get out of the building. So there's an exit sign. Now that exit sign only means one thing. It just conveys information, one bit of information. If you want to get out of the building in a hurry, here's the way to go. That's all it means, right? Now a symbol is a sign, but it's a different kind of sign than an exit sign. It's a sign that has multiple layers of meaning, like an onion. You peel back the skin of an onion, and what do you have underneath? Another layer, and another layer, and another layer. So a symbol is multi, uh, it has multi, multiple meanings. It's polyvalent. I'd like you to learn this word, okay? Polyvalent. Symbol is polyvalent. It's charged. The valence is a charge. It's charged with multiple meanings, all right? So I want to just give you an example of that. Water in baptism. Okay, first of all, it is not wrong to say that the all the sacraments are symbols, okay? Sac the sacraments are, very, are symbols in that they have multiple, the sign that is used in each sacrament have multiple meanings, like water, okay? Water means cleansing, right? Baptism, washing. Yes, but that's not the primary meaning or the only meaning. What do you mean it's not the primary? Oh, I know, new life. Ah, oh, yes, water, fountain of water. That is a very important meaning of the water of baptism. That's not all. Well, what else? How about death? What? Water and death? Yes, flood. Remember the flood? Remember what happened to the Pharaoh soldiers in the Red Sea? Well, 
in being baptized, we're going, we're dying with Christ. Paul says that, Romans 6, a number of places. Okay, the fathers of the church say that. So one of the reasons why we have a return to baptism by immersion, it's not necessary for validity, but it is a better sign. Why is it a better sign? Total submersion is like going into the tomb with Christ. It's a powerful image of what's really happening. All right. So anyway, you got life, you got death, you got cleansing. You also have Holy Spirit because Jesus uses the image of water, living water of the Holy Spirit. You also have the new birth. A mother carries a baby in water. The baptismal font is like the womb of Holy Mother Church. Okay, you have all these various charges of meaning, and that was intended by the Lord when he gave us the sacrament of baptism. And one thing I just want to point out, this is not a sacraments course, but the thing that's unique about the symbols of the sacraments is that they don't just symbolize something that's absent. They're not symbolic reminders of something that's not there. They make what they symbolize present. And in fact, in the case of the Eucharist, they the Eucharist becomes what it symbolizes. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. But here, I just don't want to alarm you, <laughs> but I want to let you understand that the, the, the sacraments are signs, and they're the kind of sign that's called a symbol, but they're unique symbols. When I want to go back to the idea of symbol, symbol has multiple meanings. Okay, so the Lord uses a myriad of symbols, analogies, and metaphors in the Old Testament, as well as Jesus teaching in the New Testament, as well as the apostles teaching after the resurrection in the other books of the New Testament. They're using metaphors and symbols and analogies all the time. And it's important to understand that a symbol speaks to the whole person, unlike a concept or abstract idea. Like an abstract idea would be democracy, freedom. A symbol would be the American flag or the Star Spangled Banner. Now I'm speaking to maybe other people who are not American here as well, but the point is, you know, when, when the Star Spangled Banner plays or the flag waves, many times there's an emotional reaction. I remember hearing when the first Gulf War happened, um, there was the TV show that I was watching interrupted and they had an image of the American flag waving and the Star Spangled Banner, an announcement that there was an invasion of Iraq uh, or, or Kuwait, That's, excuse me. So, but the point is that really brought up all sorts of images. My father fighting in World War II for the flag, fighting tyranny, you know, all sorts of things came back. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about music, uh, about art, is it speaks to the whole person, the imagination, the intellect, uh, the emotions. So that's the power of symbol and why the Lord uses it. Um, and people can be symbols. You know, Joseph sold into slavery and later saving his people. It, through giving them food and famine, you know, this is an image of Christ. Just as Isaac walking up Mount Moriah with wood on his shoulder, an image of Christ going to Golgotha with the cross on his shoulder, you know. So th there are various people. David himself is an image of Christ. Solomon, his wisdom, it's an, he's an image of Christ insofar as that, you know. Jesus is a new Elijah. You know, Elijah and Elisha were the first ones to do things like multiply food and raise the dead. You know, so in Jesus and doing those things, they symbolized him and he hearkens back to them. All right. So the point is people can be symbols. Um, uh, places can be symbols. Jerusalem, the temple, Mount Moriah, uh, Mount, um, the Mount Horeb or Sinai. OK, Th these are these are persons, places, things like the manna even fictitious things that may not have actually existed become images. In the patristic liturgy, they use the phoenix, the, the pelican, the phoenix rising from the ashes. That's a mythological symbol, okay? Another mythological symbol, the pelican, who in times of famine will actually feed little pelicans with her own blood, you know, that's a, used, you find that in art all over the place. It's a symbol. So I'm just kind of giving the idea what symbols can be. And theology really is the critical interpretation of symbolic revelation. Okay? So you'll find this uh, in Avery Dulles. Avery Dulles is known for his book, Models of the Church. Uh, but really what he was doing in there is fundamental theology. 
showing us how to look at the various images of the church and form a model uh, and make sure that we, we don't make any one model exclusive and think we have it in the can, you know? We just have to understand that every model, every image has limitations. And this is very important. How do you deal with the fact that all analogies are limited, all symbols are limited, and what they can convey about God? Simple, you use a lot of different ones to avoid relying on any one. So in the New Testament, there's 96 different images of the church. The church as the bride of Christ, the church as the body of Christ, um, uh, the church as the people of God the church as the new Israel. I mean, there's a million different images, 96 to be exact. Someone actually counted them, wrote a book about it. So just keep in mind, that's the way God does it. Since no one analogy is enough, he gives us many analogies, many different symbols. And so as, as a theologian, you realize, okay, all these things say something positive about God. Let's look at what, what they say positively, but let's not push it too far and take, and, 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 and take the symbol in a way that God does not intend it. The sacred author did not intend it, you see? Okay, so this whole idea of theology is a critical interpretation of symbolic revelation. Um, critical doesn't mean skeptical. Critical means just knowing the limits of something, all right? So you just understand its limits, you respect its limits, you don't let it exceed its limits. That's critical, all right? I wanna say something about Sheed. Frank Sheed is awesome, but I disagree with Sheed in one area. He is very much, very, he so emphasizes the limits of the imagination that he says the imagination's useless when it comes to doing theology. He does that in pages 31, 37. Well, it's really hard in understanding concepts in the theology of God. I, I grant you that. Uh, when you try to understand infinite, you try to understand eternal, okay, it's real hard. You can't imagine those things. So imagination has limits, but God uses the imagination because he uses symbols. And so what we need to do is not throw out the imagination and just try to use abstract intellect to understand God. We just got to be critical of the imagination. Okay, it's a great gift, it's a great blessing. We're grateful to God for it, but we just wanna be humble and realize that our intellect's limited and so is our imagination.